coming right there. All right, hey, so if you missed it, you can go back and watch part one in this video series where Saw Major Lamb takes us through all of his different generations of military equipment going all the way back to the Spanish-American War. We're here, we're getting ready to get into Vietnam. This is gonna be a great video. Hi, welcome back. We are gonna fast forward to 1965. We've got the iconic M14. M14, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, post us, we've been through World War II, we've been through Korea, so we've got all the uh, the upgrades between World War II and Korea, and we're fixing this slide headfirst into Vietnam. So we're still now gonna go to war in Vietnam with the stuff that we had in Korea in World War II. Now, I mean, there, was, there was a push to take all the weapon systems that they had from World War II and Korea yeah. and have the one gun to replace them the all. One gun. Yeah. Now, yeah. you had all that innovation in World War II. Literally, we went from the Wright brothers to jet engines, literally, yes. in a single generation. All the gear improvements, but then we had that long period of peacetime and general officers, senior NCOs, wanting to go backwards to the good old days, prettier. Yes. L let's get into this. Starch right and now. spits. All right. So. With the, with the weapon itself, we have a new round as well. We're no longer 30-06. We went to uh, 7.62 by 51, 51. NATO. Yep. And uh, the, the thing with this rifle was that they wanted to use some of the parts from the M1 Garand, and uh, you know, like the wood stock and some of the internals, uh, new barrel, new chamber. But uh, what happened was that it, uh, it just didn't work out because as we're sliding into Vietnam, that big gun, uh, in that weather. Try to go not, through uh, the jungle. Exactly. So, so there's a change coming. Uh, the, the boots, they go to black. So that was the end of the brown boot, brown boot army and the beginning of the black boot. And, and I, uh, I still have post-traumatic stress of polishing those things. And, and I, don't, I don't know why they did that. Black's not a color commonly found I, in nature. No, not at and all. And you can just nature. spit shine the bejesus out of this and it looks good. Looks good. So, uh, so those were the boots. The, uh, now the, the, the LBE or the load carrying equipment, not much changed from, uh, yeah, you've got different straps. These are made in 1951. Yep. Uh, they were an upgrade from the 1945 stuff that we took into Korea. Uh, this, these 1956 ammo pouches okay. to fit the new, new magazines. 14, exactly. So, uh, so again, we were talking earlier, you know, they went with these little pull tabs because the lift the dot posts, I'm having trouble with this one. The lift the dot posts that they had on quite a few of the canteens and, and everything else, uh, they had a weakness that to them. That would tear. Right yep. here, yeah, it would, it would take that post out and then you got something flapping. So they went with these, these didn't, uh, these lasted us probably, you know, through Vietnam until they came up with the plastics in like 1968. But it would, you could fit two uh, M14 magazines in, in here. You had, uh, again, a, a place to put your Pineapple grenades. I actually and, ran one of these pouches on my kit with my two issued uh, pouches in Desert Storm. I ran one of these on my kit. Well, it's true, you can, you can it's, still it's, find it. It's a great yep. size pouch for all your extra stuff. Exactly. Uh, I like the extra stuff. Same canteen, M1910, uh, basically. Uh, the metal canteen, different uh, plastic uh, top on it. Uh, still hanging from the loops mm -hmm. below your belt, so we haven't put them on the belt yet. It's still it's still hanging below the belt, standard pistol belt, and uh, so again, not a whole lot changed uh, going into uh, going into the early days of Vietnam. The uniform. This is the 1951. This is the actual OG 107. The uh, the OG 107. The standard. Yep. For and, uh, decades, right? You see, we, we got uh, we got rid of the cargo pockets again. I don't know what the deal is, <laughs> but uh, you know, you, you you got them in wartime. A garrison military. Garrison environment, you could, exactly. You could iron these. It's, you can iron them. You can start them. Make them pretty. Yeah. You, I mean, can you could stand. Them. They would stand stand alone in the corner. And, and put uh, that at the bottom. Nice creases. Cuff. Super numerable. You look super pretty. <laughs> <laughs> super pretty in pictures. And, uh, so it just had patch pockets on the front, patch pockets on the back, very easy, very simple. Again, no cargo pockets. Uh, we called this the pickle suit. This was the longest running uniform that we had in the inventory. It went from literally from 1951 all the way to 1985. Wow. And uh, when, the, when we transitioned. Now the, uh, again, if you look at this, guys aren't getting shot at. So what do we do? We color it up. 
and uh, so the name tape is uh, is white. U.S. Army is black and gold because what are the Army colors? You guessed it, black and yeah, gold. Yeah, black and gold. All the patches are uh, are not subdued. So uh, and then you got the big old rank on the sleeve. So uh, this is you are just a walking target. Aim small, miss small. Uh, but you can find pictures of the guys going into Vietnam early in '64, '65, yeah. and they were dressed like this. I got pictures of Kenny McMullen dressed in this uniform with uh, wearing all these colors. And we had uh, we had an ascot. Why would they have and, to wear uh, I th this was just for ceremony. So if you look at uh, if you look at a lot of the you know for when you're dressing up and you got yeah. your fines on, you're starched, you got your spit shines, you got your high and tight, mm -hmm. and you put this ascot on and it just tops it off, my brother. It makes you look pretty. Now, so uh, this is the duck hunter. Uh, this the special forces guys wore this uh, almost exclusively, and uh, you could uh, this to hide one, the white t-shirt. Probably to hide the white t-shirt. Yeah. So. The guys in World War II, right? They're dyeing their t-shirts. They get issued a white one, and yeah. then they dye it and, uh, using tea or whatever they could get their hands on to, to, to subdue it. So there's but, nowhere to uh, put that front sight post on your German <laughs> rifle, right? You don't want a nice white dot to put your... So, so post, we, you know, in, in, the, in the peacetime years, we're, <laughs> we're, we're wearing white t-shirts, all these multicolored patches. Uh, we get away from this belt, which is a color commonly found in nature. Yeah. We go with black. And this nice shiny and buckle. just top it off with and, uh, oh I don't know something that glints in the sun from 10 kilometers away. And so this is probably the best looking uniform we ever had for garrison. Yeah. But uh, not did not combat. last very long in Vietnam. I think it was it was just a couple of years before everything went subdued. And then of course the uh, the green beret with the with the fifth group flash. The cover. This was uh, green this beret. was the initial one with the uh, uh, the, the Vietnam flag. Yeah. Uh, in the in the crest or in the in the, in the patch rather. Yeah. And uh, we actually went back to this. We did, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it is it is now the official 5th Group Flash. Nice. And it, it was common during those days for the forward deployed groups to actually put the colors. Like, you'll, you'll find a red Panama flash with the Panama flag. You'll find a green um, uh, flag with the German colors in it from the guys in, in, in 110. So this is, uh, this is the, peace, the peacetime army uh, heading into Vietnam. And so I, I suggest we go there next. Awesome. Let's slide to Vietnam. And uh, before we do that, again, another commercial. I'll see you guys back in just a second. All right, hey, welcome back. We are going to fast forward to 1968. Yep. And we're in Vietnam. We're in Vietnam. So, uh, you know, the, the uniform that we had on before with all the colors, that, that has gone away. Gone. The old uh, M14, that has also gone away. Now, we, so, uh, this is a brand new gun at the time. Exactly. Brand new the, gun. Uh, the M16A1, based on the uh, the stoner, or the armor like. Yep. And uh, the guys liked it. The black rifle. The black rifle, exactly. They, they had some issues with it, uh, based on ammunition. I mean, so, so a lot of the older guys, this is one of those changes where the older guys like the feel of the wood. Yeah. You know, the younger guys, uh, the SF guys, uh, primarily liked this weapon, and in the next video, you'll see how they modified it for their, for their use. Fit their needs. And this sling right here literally brought us to uh, the global war on terror. Literally. True, without a doubt. It, All right. Uh, um, uh, yeah, we we've got uh, we went from 20 round magazines to 30 round magazines by this time. We've got uh, a new caliber. It's actually 5.56. So uh, so that's the new NATO round. Your 762s, uh, you're still carrying 762 uh, machine guns, machine but, guns. Uh, but that is your standard battle The M60 racket. machine gun back then. So if we start Ooh. with the, uh, the load carrying equipment, this is the 1956, and this is all complete. And uh, so it's, uh, it's still primarily made out of uh, cotton. Cotton. So it's, it's heavy, it's heavy when it's wet. But uh, you see the introduction of a butt pack, and uh, so you can put rations in there for short patrols, uh, what have you. You get your canteen pouches. They're still the M1910, um, you know, design, but now they've got the Alice clips on the back, and they actually go on the belt, on so they're the higher up, and they're, so not, they're not, not beating flapping. you exactly, yep. not flapping. You've still got, uh, even though you got M16 magazines, and uh, you can now only put 20 rounders in this M1956. So the 30 round magazines or uh, pouches are coming in the next generation. You get your uh, your standard bayonet. You've got uh, your standard um, uh, 1911, you know, 45 For your round. Side you get, you get arm, yeah. two, two side arm. Still now, frags, but still we've gotten frags. away from the pineapples. Exactly. The pineapples were the, were the Gen 1. These are the Gen 2. This is the M26 okay. uh, fragmentation grenade, but it's still, you know, it's not round yet. Yeah. So, uh, but you're starting to see some M67s come into the into the war. 
And, uh, oh, plastic canteens. Uh, you've got snaps. Basically, they got rid of the uh, the lift the dot yeah. because those were uh, those were not. Uh, they're breaking. They're breaking. You've even got the dummy cord. I'm sorry, Ranger assist cord. Exactly. On so your you, canteen. You do not want to lose this. Not canteen. a dummy cord. It's a so Ranger to, assist uh, cord. We go to plastic. Now, and if you notice here, it says for water only. Do not apply canteen to open flame or burner plate. So they actually had to tell the guys, do not apply this to heat. Because remember, up to this yeah, time, you got metal you, ones. You could yep. cook, uh, you could literally heat water in your canteen. In your canteen. The guys were cooking in their steel pot helmets. Exactly. And, you know, heating water to shave. No, we just were. Yep. Um, All right, you got what, uh, we were doing. what we were talking about earlier, too, with the Textron guys, is that uh, this is what made it an automatic rifle. If my job was squad automatic rifleman for my squad. I had the same gun, but now... Literally, that's as high speed as it gets, that's and it. I would get one extra mag you get, you get three extra magazines, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, whether they be 20 rounders, you're hoping they're 30 rounders. <laughs> that's some <laughs> high tech stuff right there. If you look at your uh, the magazine or the, the pistol um, holster, went you're, you're, we're still carrying uh, M1911s, but uh, we went from brown leather to black leather, and we're still carrying still. the old faithful M1911 45 caliber pistol, which is. Uh, Still my favorite. And we've added a, uh, a first aid pouch. They can either be a first aid pouch or, or a compass pouch. Compass, yeah. And, uh, but this is, uh, this is the web gear that they initially took to Vietnam. It's, uh, it's heavy, but uh, it was- Especially uh, when it gets wet, because this oh, yeah. canvas, it's cotton, but it's still thick cloth, and it just True. soaks the water up. Yeah. Big, but big improvement from, uh, from the, uh, the stuff that they were carrying before. Now you're also starting to see Some nylon coming into play so this is one of the early rucksacks that uh and you can as you can see that it's 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 nylon yeah and it's a smaller uh, it's a small rucksack comes with a uh, with a frame now so uh, all the rucksacks that you've seen before this uh didn't have frames to them but now you've got a uh, frame that actually keeps it uh, lets you supports it on, supports your, back, it on your back exactly and uh, not a great attempt at a, a waistband belt is exactly. that what that is yep yeah, but you can okay. uh, you can adjust that, keep it off your the, back, the, keep the it from rubbing. Pad, yeah. And uh, because remember we got the snaps back there, and we used to call them meat hooks. Yeah, because uh, on the LBE that he just lowered, those would just dig into your back. Woo. You had your entrenching tool. The uh, this was actually a nice upgrade because you could put your bayonet on your entrenching tool, mm -hmm. and uh, the the soft guys didn't generally carry them. This would be for an infantry kid that's going to go in and, and he's got to dig. He's got to dig in. And uh, the nice thing about this one here, don't judge me, it's not clean, but it, uh, you've got a pick now. And uh, so this is- Getting was, through pickaxe to get through the hard, yeah. hard rock and dirt, and then you've still got your spade for digging. Still got your spade, so you can either use it in shovel mode, or you can tighten this down. Pickaxe and a hoe. Pickaxe mode, and uh, you can get through all the, exactly the roots that was Vietnam. The monsoons of Vietnam have let up a little bit, and uh, you can hear a little better now. So this was uh, this went with the jungle fatigues. We had a new uniform yep. and uh, boonie cap. So the uh, it's, it's a boonie cap keeps the sun out of your eyes, keeps the uh, wind off your face or the, uh, the the rain off your face, and it came with a net. So you just put this over the top, and now you've got a uh, a mosquito net that uh, keep the uh, Keep mosquitoes off your face. The rest of your body's still exposed, yep. but we got sleeves down all Correct. the way. If you can keep the them off your neck, you can sleep with that. You can. You get you got bug juice exactly. So uh, that that's that's the point. Is that uh, you're you're it's at night, you're in a hole, you're sleeping, and because uh, they generally would not move through the bush with this, because it uh, just doesn't give yeah, you. Yeah, you can't see through. Yep. Uh, you got your standard M1 steel pot still. It uh, standard two piece. And, uh, but now you've got this uh, Mitchell pattern camouflage on it. So this was uh, our next generation of camouflage, you know, from the Duck Hunter to the Mitchell. And we added the elastic strap. Correct, you got your yeah. elastic strap, and then you see a lot of times the guys will carry these uh, speed, speed loaders, loaders yeah. to help load their magazines. And this is innovated, issued now, but remember generations back, that was made out of cut up uh, truck tire tubes yep. and stuff. Exactly, inner tube. 
Now, we went back to green t-shirts. Why did we get away from God, white t-shirts? No oh, just such so, a uh, great idea, white so t-shirts. Uh, but again, you know, these have changed over, over time just w since we were in. Yeah. I mean, it went from, uh, from an olive green, and it went to uh, kind of a brown, then to a tan, and uh, so you got your uh, olive green. Now, body armor, this is, this is our first attempt. This actually started in Korea, a similar vest, uh, but this one I think is 1968 issue. Doesn't stop a bullet. It's just for fragmentation. Fragmentation. And, uh, it, you, you see some pictures of the guys wearing these. The uh, I don't think they wore it very often because of the damn heat. And, and just the uh, weight. But it had a guys. It's got a collar. You, if you look statistically, a lot of the injuries that people were having earlier on, a lot of it's from shrapnel, from artillery shells, things like that. And it was thought that this would help protect our guys. Again, we're fighting the last. We're fighting the next war with gear from our last war and lessons learned from that one. And uh, yeah, it, it doesn't stop bullets at all. Very it does happy, not happy, stop exactly. bullets at all. A uh, couple, couple big uh, cargo pockets and then you've got uh, some straps here to hang some, hang some knickknacks on, but uh, you would wear this over your uniform with your LCE over the top, your load carrying equipment. Nothing like wearing a fur coat uh, in the middle of the jungle. And then you have the Vietnam jungle fatigues. And uh, these jungle fatigues were, uh, were a poplin uh, ripstop. Uh, the initial ones were, were just poplin cotton. And then after a while, you know, with all the vines, they actually put the ripstop in there. And uh, you've got, uh, but again, you've got all your shoulder patch swag on here. Uh, but if you notice, everything is now subdued. And, uh, but we still have um, sleeves. And we still do that today. Yeah. We, we went to ACUs, no, no patches. You're not allowed to have patches. And then yeah. it was, oh, pin on patches, pin on, True, I remember badges, that, yeah, yeah. and then, well, you know, the the garrison guys wanted them sewn on so they could show off their bling and combat zones, and uh, yeah, it did, history it's repeats. just amazing how history repeats itself so much, and that that's the that's my big takeaway from this study history because it 100% repeats yeah. itself. It really does. And, and we have a new boot. The, uh, which we'll, we'll show in the next video, uh, the jungle okay. boot. That's where nice. the jungle boot makes its first appearance. Jungle boots. Yeah. I wore them in the desert and desert storm. Uh, that, that was still That's my favorite pretty boot. pretty pitiful. Yeah. I did, I wore just green boots. <laughs> Norman Schwarzkopf had the new desert boots. Exactly. I wore green ones. But you know, that, that jungle boot is uh, what carried us into the 90s. It did, it's that, that awesome. Pattern, yeah. Cool, we're gonna get into that next chapter uh, here in just a minute. Time for another commercial. I'll see y'all when you get back. All right, welcome back. Now we're still in Vietnam, yes. But uh, let's go look at the MacV Sog guys. They're you want to talk about innovation, adapting equipment. These guys were the masters of chaos at the time. Oh, bat shit crazy. Um, they, this, is, this is another table that I could spend days on. Literally, so humor me. Humor me. Let's start here. We got a new weapon. All right, it's the, uh, we, we go to Vietnam, we, we transition to the M16, 5.56. The black rifle. The black rifle. All right, the SOG guys, they needed something smaller because remember, they're, uh, they're doing top secret missions in Laos and Cambodia where we're not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. They went in with no dog tags, no identification, so that uh, they knew that if their body, if they died over there, then, then we, they disavow all knowledge. Plausible deniability. Exactly. By so the politicians. They need, exactly. So they needed uh, a shorter gun that they, that they could wield uh, in, in small spaces. So they came out with the XM-177. Uh, it's the XM-177 E1. So it, uh, that is the forerunner of the, uh, the CAR-15 Car and the M4 that we, uh, that we, we have today. today. Yeah. Now they had a, initially they ran about a four inch flash suppressor on this, but some guys were able to fashion a, uh, a suppressor. Okay. And uh, so this one I, I went ahead and suppressed. The uh, they, sling they was so they could run it over there, basically like you're saying, hold it at their waist, patrol. Correct. So they had to come up with a different sling. Well, because they're because they're coming uh, they're coming in and out of helicopters. I mean, yeah. That was their primary means of getting mm -hmm. in and out. And uh, it was Vietnamese helicopters, the big Jolly Greens. So the uh, they some of them ran a uh, this is an early scope a, a sco uh, Colt. It was a four power four by twenty telescope. Some of the guys liked it, some of the guys didn't. I went ahead and loaded this one up. Uh, they had a lot of 20 round magazines, some 30 round magazines, and that was, uh, that was a problem for them because they didn't have some of the latest equipment. Uh, but they did have this, the, it had a, uh, this is actually an aluminum uh, buttstock. What, really, aluminum? Yep. Wow. Some of, the, some of the differences that you see between the, uh, the, our modern day stuff. You know, we have plastics and polymers. You've got to have a little thumb uh, or a, a, little, a little 
thumb nub now nub, on ours. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It, uh, but this is and, and it had a uh, the, the standard A1 sights and a carrying handle. Uh, but again, the they, they would use uh, anything from uh, the anything that they could get their hands on. Uh, I've seen some that are woven, but this one here came off of an M14. M14. It's got, it's got a grenade pull pin here for front sling uh, swivel, and then he added a field dressing which sealed in plastic, shields it from the jungle environment, the rain and everything <laughs> coming down. And uh, again, held in place with a ranger band made exactly. from a cut yep. uh, from inner, inner tube. tube. Yep. So now it's literally the, right there. You could be yep. on your way to the chow hall with no gear. You're always gonna have your rifle. Correct. And you've got a battle dressing with you. And the, these guys did IFAX, you know, individual first aid kits before there were individual first exactly. aid kits. They, you know, they, awesome. they would shove dressings into every every nook and cranny and pocket that, that, that they had. Uh, the sidearm, a lot of them would use the uh, the trusty M1911, the uh, the 45 caliber. But if you could get a hold of a Browning high power, that was also uh, that was also desirable because you had uh, you had more rounds in your magazine. It was it was a smaller nine millimeter, but you could uh, you could run more rounds. More rounds, exactly. And 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 it was this was all about rounds. So we'll go there next. The, uh, since they would go in in small groups, it was only like two or three Americans, and they would be with their uh, their Vietnamese indigenous, counterparts, yep. their ind indigenous guys. Now, if you look at this, or uh, this is actually a stable harness. This is something that they pioneered, and uh, the riggers made it. And uh, it is a harness. Stay, stabo stands for. It stands for the. I, I, I think it's the two guys that made it. It's their initials. Okay. So it does. It's not like a. Uh, like an a, acronym. Yeah, exactly. I was told it was like, stay below. Like you can't, you ain't getting your ass up in the helicopter <laughs> till we land. That could be. No. We have to research that. But it, from what I understand, it's not like fries. You know, the fast rope uh, yeah. insertion extraction yeah. system. You know, the uh, I, it's my understanding that that Stabo was the guy's name. The rings, guys. Basically, middle of the jungle. You can't land the helicopter. They could literally drop a couple of ropes down. You hook them to each shoulder. Yes. And literally, they pull you up out of the jungle, like pulling a weed out of your garden, mm -hmm. and you hang out underneath the helicopter until they land the helicopter. You've got two leg straps here that come off of the parachute harness. So it's just a, uh, it's a standard parachute harness with two clips that would clip onto the, uh, the rope that's dangling underneath the helicopter. And then, of course, before you had them pull you up, you put these between your legs, and then... Like a parachute. Like artist, a parachute. Yep. Get down, get low. Make sure your junk ain't your, pinched. Your, your junk ain't pinched, exactly. That'll, that'll, that'll earn you a uh, California so avocado. They you know kicked I mean. out three ropes. You'd have a little Ys at the end with hooks, and you, you'd hook them in. Now, the key is, if there were two of us on our team, or three of us, you had to make sure you linked arms because if you didn't link arms, you would spin like a top and you would start spinning faster and faster and faster. Now you get closer to the helicopter when that happens, but it's not a pleasant ride. You put your arms out and sounds great. A great ride in peacetime training as a scout. But can you imagine being pulled out of the jungle in the middle of a combat zone where everybody below you has got an AK and oh, you're gonna so, ride the whole way back to behind friendly lines. These guys were If, if you've never amazing. read the book uh, Behind the Fence, John Striker Mayer, okay. and to get that book. Uh, Jocko does a podcast with John Striker Mayer. He does Behind the Fence. Behind the Fence, yeah. Right. And it, uh, or Across the Fence, I'm sorry. Across, across the, the Fence. fence. And uh, so Across the Fence, and, uh, it is just hair raising. I mean, you can do a three hour podcast on just that book alone and never want to get up to go to the bathroom or eat. It's just, it is that riveting. Really? And oh yeah, some of the close calls that those guys had. And they would carry no less than about six hand grenades. Uh, sometimes they'd, uh, they'd have them in Claymore bags. The, uh, or other times they would have it uh, you know, wherever they could put mm -hmm. the grenades. Sometimes they put them in these canteen pouches. But the Claymore bag was a, was a nice piece of kit. It actually had Claymores in it. Yeah. Uh, but also they could put anything, anything. This, this was our shaving kit back in the day, if you remember. It, it, I, I do, unfortunately. <laughs> I do know. It would set off the explosive detectors in the airport when you flew with it. Now th these are the standard M1956 um, cotton, heavy cotton. They Canteen. liked the heavy yep. cotton, uh, but they had the snaps on them. Nice the, uh, the, the lifted yep. dots. They actually mounted on the belt. 
and they would use these canteen pouches for their ammunition. Okay. And the, and the reason why would that, they do that? Because they couldn't. It was all about ammo. Uh, you know, the, the, today we train. Yep. You know, double tap two, yeah, yeah. two and him, two and him, two and him across. Yeah. These guys were, were just spray. Pray because and spray because you're you're in you're surrounded. You're four in jungle, years. And, uh, and what they want to do is just 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 cut it down. And you could carry up to 720 rounds on this rig. And uh, wow. I asked uh, General Bore, who was uh, uh, RT Sidewinder, I said, did you ever shoot all that ammo? And he said there was one particularly bad day where he was on his last 20 round magazine. So he had, he had shot 600 rounds uh, at, at the end of the end. And, and it was ingenious the way they did it. So you've got your, uh, your canteen pouch here. I don't know if you guys can see this, but you've got a canteen pouch in the center where the neck is, you would have a 30 rounder. And, and then uh, once the end of that's the, out, every every magazine basically had a uh, had a little thumb loop on it so that you could get at it quickly. So you have one 30 rounder in this canteen pouch, and that is surrounded by five 20 round magazines that you can get to. Now, I don't know if y'all caught that, but with that 30 rounder wedged in there, there was no rattle at all. This other exactly. one's not making any noise at all. But as soon as he did that first pull of that 30, it loosened them all up. Now it's gunfights on. It's okay to be loud. We're gonna make noise burning through the rest of them. It, it, I mean, it, if you look at that, it's simple. It's ingenious. <laughs> yeah, they would run four or five of these around the belt. And uh, just incredible innovation. Again, this was their IFAC. It was an old World War II. Um, uh, the standard Pacific, field first yeah, aid kit. Yeah, yeah. The field first aid kit, but mostly for the jungle because it had more stuff in it. Because you, know, you get uh, anything from ammonium to, I mean, you, you get you get more sick. Yeah. In the jungle. Yeah, without a doubt. They'd have their. Uh, they always would have a knife, and uh, generally anything that's that's mounted here is mounted. Uh, weight, you know, you got to have your shoulder clear for your for yeah, your, uh, for your rifle. Yeah. So you, they would carry a, uh, a a knife on one side. You had to have your knife. Either a first aid pouch, or, or you could just put anything in here, your morphine or what have you. The uh, strobe light, so that they could uh, signal. be, yeah. get signaled to, to get pulled out. This was a small protective mask. I've, I've only got the carrying case. Really? Yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's a little protective mask, and they would use it if they're popping uh, CS grenades. CS grenades to, to, break, to break contact, contact. Exactly. that makes sense. And, and basically, it's, it's, it's very small, it folds in half, and it just fits right to your face. It's not good for anything other than riot control, and so you'll see a lot of the, a lot of the guys' web gear carrying this. And then again, wherever you can get a hand grenade, you would put a hand grenade. Uh, they would carry up to six hand grenades, so wherever you could put a hand grenade, is uh, you, you would put a hand grenade. You could, you, you, whether you're pinning it, tying it, yeah. uh, any way that you could get it in there, you would have a hand grenade on you. The rope. The Swiss seat. Swiss exactly. seat. I've got so if you're, uh, a lot of time tying a, a Swiss seat. So again, this uh, you just a little piece of rope, kind of like the paratrooper guys has. So if you get caught in the trees, you can get down. But also, you can turn this into a, a Swiss seat and hook into the aircraft that way. And uh, so they always had a, a length of rope. And your guys and your team, literally, we could hook them all together. And now you've got a rope for getting across swollen rivers that are moving fast, for getting up and down hills that are too steep. We can tie uh, ourselves together. Yep, it's a, the, it's uh, all yeah. about teamwork. All right, this is the ERDL camouflage. So it's, it's just the standard Vietnam jungle uniform, but uh, this is in the, uh, and I think it's the uh, Experimental uh, Research and Development Laboratory. It was, it was prior to Natick. Okay. So it's an ERDL. Actually came out with it in about 1947, 1948. But again, we had, we had such bad luck with camo and yeah. uh, yep. it never came out until Vietnam. So they actually used it. It came in, uh, we had a light green and then you had a darker brown. So one was woodland, one was, uh, one was jungle. So these, uh, talking to uh, General Bore, he said it was, these weren't issued to the SOG guys. But uh, if you knew a ranger, or a LERP, then you could trade him something and you'd get a uniform. So you'll see some pictures of uh, General Bore out there as a young lieutenant, and he's got these on. Because and he's he, proud he, to have them. He traded yep. rangers for it, exactly. Awesome Jungle stuff. boots, they had uh, the standard jungle boot. A lot of times you could go down to the uh, the guys downtown and they would put a different sole yeah, on Yeah, vibrant and, uh, soles, it didn't, did not come with that sole, did not. So you could put a, a vibrant sole and then uh, they would actually rip out the, uh, the interior of this, mm -hmm. which had a, 
uh, put some knees foot oil on that thing, and now you have a, a set of tennis shoes. So if you've ever worn really jungle boots, you've never, you'll never see them that pliable. These are well broken, comfortable because you're putting oh, yeah. hundreds of miles on. Yeah, and uh, these were I, I actually trips. wore these uh, when I was on active duty, so they're, uh, they're, they're they've been. Broken. You've got a few miles yeah. in, a few miles. Now a lot of times, depending on where they were going and, and who they were trying to pretend to be. They would wear the North Vietnamese uh, jungle boot, yeah. basically, and it's it's a Chai Com, it's a Chai Com variant, because they wanted the soles and uh, the, they footprints, wanted, the uh, footprints being seen behind enemy lines. Remember, they're in countries that they're not allowed to be in, and this way they're not leaving the telltale footprint of the American or GI uh, jungle boot. Yeah. I heard they even tried soles that were in the shape of, of feet. feet exactly they feet. did yep. but the, the problem though is as soon as you rolled your foot in the mud yep. it would have the sharp edge on the side and Correct. you could tell it was yep. fake now but when they would wear these low shoes they would uh, they actually brought these back out of retirement brought the gators so the back. Old gators uh from from world war ii fame so you'll see a lot of the pictures of the saw guys where they'll actually have these uh, these shoes and the gators or sometimes even the jungle boots and the gators and again just uh, snakes sticks vines and uh, it's good protection for your uh, for your lower leg. Awesome. Now, again, talking to uh, General Bore, they use this. Uh, they use the Chinese AK the, uh, yeah. the, Exactly. So this, uh, he said, the neat thing about this was if if you could get one, they were like gold, because you didn't stay around long enough after contact yeah. to actually go in and get one. Uh, and then if you did, it generally had a hole in it. <laughs> So he said That's if you awesome. could get one of these without a hole in it, <laughs> then you were good to go. Because that gives you what? Six more 30 round 30 magazines round mags. Uh, in this. And so you'll see uh, General Bowridge just loaded up with this exact uh, belt, with this exact vest in this uniform. And you'll see that uh, online today. So mm -hmm. look, look him up, man. He's a, he is a war horse. Without He's a still doubt. with us and General he's hard General was a uh, machine. All right, so the uh, one of the things that the boys did uh, was they took... Uh, like the paratroopers before them, they took the uh, the lower pockets off. Cut the pockets off and, down here on the front of their blouse. Yep, and sewed it onto the uh, to, to the, sleeve. the sleeve. And now we're still doing to, that to this day. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we uh, remember when we were in C Company. We thought we were cool because we we did it on yeah. our BDUs. Till the saw guys said we did it, but they don't feel bad because we got it from the paratroopers. Yeah, so exactly. It just, it, but it's good because <laughs> it, it keeps coming back, yeah. and now it is the standard. So what used to get you an ass chewing by the Sergeant Major is now the Army standard. I hate Sergeant Majors. I, I always hated Sergeant Majors. <laughs> now the neat thing about these guys are way ahead of their times. We, we put our blood type on right. everything yep. we owned. Yep. These guys uh, would use name tapes. So uh, one, one side would say their blood type spelled out O negative. <laughs> uh, the other side would say no reaction. That's reaction to penicillin or any yep. other meds. We so do no... N-K-D-A uh, now, no known drug allergies. Yes. You see guys with yep. their little sexy uh, Velcro tabs and Correct. Uh, yep. just Gucci it, crap, but this, it, this it is came legitimate. At, yep. circa 1970, yeah. 1969. And of course, your faithful pace cord that you would always have. The thing about these guys is there was a place for everything, everything in its place. And uh, just, uh, I mean, fascinating. I could spend hours on this. Standard M1 helmet. Generally, they didn't have the cover, uh, but uh, if they ever needed it for parachute jumping, those guys did about a dozen round canopy parachute drops in Vietnam. Some of the first halo and, uh, drops. Some were, of the first halo yeah. drops, but uh, when the ADA threat got to the point where it was too dangerous to fly high, they went in low. They went treetop level and they would just uh, bank the bird up, everybody poops out the back, yeah. and you're in a the, round canopy, you're on the what ground. What they call those little going. birds, the twin engines? Uh, yeah, the 123s. The uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. The 123 C7 Caribou. Yeah, yeah, Caribou. So again, they had uh, they also had the uh, the the olive drab or uh, you know jungle fatigue, and they had the uh, the variant of the you know the ERDL camo hat. Now you never saw these generally. The uh, they they would cut the cut the brim slower because it uh, or you know shorter to about uh, three inches so that you could hear and it yeah. wasn't as distracting so you could see better you could hear better. But uh, they, most of the guys said they, they only wore these if they were in garrison. If uh, if they were out in the bush, they wore a do-rag. Drive-on rag, the do-rag. Yeah, the do-rag. The, 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 what used to get us the ass chewing um, was what they pioneered in Vietnam because it sop, sops up the sweat. Yeah, keeps and, it out uh, of your eyes. You know, John Stryker Mayer had blonde hair. 
like Stu yeah. used to have. Stu's used to have. gray now, but yeah. it used to be blonde. So, and uh, so he said he's the only blonde guy out there. And uh, so he wore a do-rag. And uh, then they would wear a second one, cravat, around their neck. Yeah. A lot of times they would wear a cravat for a belt or a tourniquet for yeah. a belt. So again, if, uh, if somebody gets wounded, you've got yeah, plenty cr of... Cravats are a triangular bandage is basically, yeah. if you're getting these from the medics, we call them cravats or a handkerchief, but it's in the military, it's a triangular bandage. Somebody gets shot in the arm, remember you're still deep behind enemy lines. You can use it as a sling for a broken arm. You can use it for a tourniquet with a uh, stick full of wing list. For oh, pressure yeah. dressing. Uh, pressure the, dressing. Uh, and so, yeah, so they would have, have a them bunch of them. All over them. Yeah. Everywhere. And uh, just incredible. When and, you remember uh, Tom McCoy? He was one of the cell leaders I in Djibouti. Yep, yep. Tom McCoy used to take his desert boonie cap and he would trim it down to just a little bit yes. because Tom is another uh, fan of history and yep. it does repeat itself. It really does. So Tom, if you're watching, yeah, you were awesome, but you didn't come <laughs> up with it. We love you, Tom. We love you. You know, it, 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 this is an actual. This is a no kid in 1968. And I fight the urge every day to cut it down, but I mean, it's... Don't do it. Yeah, it's, nope. it's up, Don't I'm gonna, do it. I'm going to buy Don't a repro and, and maybe get after it. But again, this is this is SOG in a nutshell. Um, again, across the fence. Get that. Uh, listen to the Jocko podcast. I mean, John Stryker, Mayor, anything with Ken Bora, uh, Bo Ray, rather. And uh, just fascinating history with these guys. Awesome. Way ahead of their time. All right, we're going to break for another commercial, and then we're going to come back for some of your history. Yes. All right, yeah. All right we'll see you all in a minute. All right, welcome back. We are going to fast forward to 1980. That's when you actually came in the military. Correct, yep. Right, so you were back, still had the, M the trusty M16. Yep. This A1. Is a1, but this is literally modeled after yours. This, this would have been the kit that Private Lamb would have been issued Private in uh, Lamb. Ranger Battalion. Wow. And, and again, to, sh to show how fast, you know, remember we talked about World War II. Yeah. Within five years, we've lost it. So we take a shot in the jimmies uh, as we're in going Korea. into Korea. Yep. Then, then we then we go up. We innovate, you know, and, and then we plateau again. Then we go back to colored uniforms and that kind of stuff. Politicians. Then, yeah, politicians. Yes, there are politicians in the military. There are. Take a face shot again into Vietnam. By the end of the Vietnam, you know, the uh, we're 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 pretty we're pretty hot. We're here. awesome. And, uh, and but a lot of those guys get flushed out because you know you peacetime cut, you cut army. back peacetime army. So one of the things that uh, General Abrams did, who was chief of staff of the army at the time, he stood up uh, the Rangers again because they every you know, you'd bring the Rangers in for combat, then you stand them down, and then you bring them back, and then you stand them down. So they had stood the Rangers down from Vietnam. They were companies assigned to infantry divisions. Mm -hmm. So he actually brought back the World War II Ranger Battalion. Battalions. Yeah, he had one first first battalion on the East Coast, second battalion on the West Coast. So when I first walk into uh, to first Ranger Battalion, this is what I would have been issued. Now I, I, I got to have a shameless plug here for uh, for my mates at uh, Charlie Company First Battalion, 75th Infantry Ranger. And so this is uh, the guide on. I didn't steal this. I actually had it he, made. He didn't Captain steal Graves, it. I did not steal wink, it. Wink, wink. Wink. And uh, and and What's this for thing those that, yeah, for those that don't know, it, on a company guide, uh, you got to turn you, it uh, and hold it that way so if, they can read it. If you ever, if you got uh, over sixty percent of your people got an expert infantryman's badge, you're holding then, it upside uh, down though. Right? I think, yeah, no, can like, you guys read that? Expert infantry. So you, you got a uh, you got a streamer. Yeah, you guys can read it. Okay. You got a streamer that uh, that designated your company as an expert infantry company. So in 1980, we were an expert infantry company. I got my everybody in battalion badge, the EIB, <laughs> the expert infantryman's badge. I can't complain because <laughs> I got mine, uh, yeah, I came in five years later. And uh, yeah, it took me a couple years to get the expert infantryman's badge. So uh, I did get it. I did. And, and, uh, and if you went to war with that company, then you would get a combat, combat infantryman's infantry badge. badge. Now, if you look at the uh, the headgear, still the old trusty M1 steel pot. Steel pot. Yep. It, paratrooper model had a uh, has a little uh, cushion in, in the, the back, back yep. for the for the pad. It's got your uh, your chin strap, got your neck strap, and uh, this is I've actually jumped this. I'll, I'll jump this next month in uh, Palatka, as a matter of fact. Cool. We're, we're going uh, we're going all retro Vietnam vintage. You love this stuff. And, you love uh, it. Oh god! It, so when we cranked the... up for the Iranian hostage rescue mission. 
we got into vehicles. So yeah, we were Robert Rangers, swamp rats up until the, uh, the embassy was taken in Iran. And then Captain Grange, then the company commander, pulled us out. He wanted to know uh, who drove Jeeps, who drove motorcycles, who the best machine gunners were. And uh, because he's tasked organizing yeah. the company to do this mission. And uh, so if you were on a gun Jeep, then, uh, then you, you need sun, were, wind, and exactly, dust goggles. You need some sun, wind, and dust goggles. So we had those. And this, uh, it's got the cat eyes in the back, which designates now he's that, a member of Charlie Company 1st Battalion. Yep, that's a luminous tape. Uh, you sew it on, basically cat eyes glowed in the dark. So they only glow for so long, but uh, you could quickly Recharge hold a flashlight flash to light. it. Exactly. Yep. Or in anger school, <laughs> uh, you could recharge them all by throwing a uh, artillery simulator behind all the Ranger <laughs> students. I know that because I had a couple of you heard. RIs uh, that were not happy with us one night. Yeah, I'm having flashbacks here. Awesome. Now, one of the things that the Rangers did is they tied everything down, like this camouflage. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's tied down. So, you because know, if you lost it, you gun. were screwed. Yep, exactly. You tied down. Screwed. So everything, that's where the dummy cord, Ranger cord comes from. Ranger Every piece of kit cord. Uh, exactly has <laughs> has a purpose. Yep. Awesome now, stuff. Now, we were issued the uh, ERDL camouflage. And... Uh, from Vietnam, that was the, we were, I think, the only guys in the Army wearing it at the time, along with our jungle boots. And uh, at that time, we, uh, we were authorized a colored patch. Nice. So I think the 101st uh, still had a non-subdued, and uh, the big red one still had a non-subdued. Uh, green patch with, the, a, 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 with a, a red, red one, one down yep, the middle exactly. of it. Okay. From the 1st Infantry Division, and then, of course, the Rangers. The scrolls uh, were patterned after either Korea or Vietnam. You know, the, uh, the, the modern day Rangers now, since they stood up the regiment, they yeah. all have the, the World War II era scroll. Okay. And uh, so, and you were authorized uh, jump wings, foreign jump wings on your, on your uniform. Yeah. So, and those are the, British, uh, aren't they? This here is, uh, it looks like British, but they're actually Belgian. So Belgium. Uh, I okay. went to, to Belgium with 3rd Ranger Battalion, and uh, I try not to put anything on a uniform that I didn't earn. That's so everything fair. that you'll see on all the uniforms that are sewn on or, uh, or you know, I went to Ranger School, I was a Sergeant Major in Special Forces, so it, uh, everything tracks back to, uh, to something I actually was issued and earned. Nice. Awesome, awesome. Uh, the LCE. Ah, uh, the LCE. You see that uh, this guy here is not much changed from the M1956. Um, it's not the H harness anymore, you got a single strap in the back, uh, but everything has gone nylon. So, uh, yeah, and uh, these are the hooks we were talking about that dig hooks. into your back, the yeah. meat hooks. Had to yeah. be taped, everything had to be tied down so that you wouldn't lose it on a parachute drop. Even your, uh, even your bayonet had a little loop of uh, 550 cord going through there to... Uh, You've got to go into this down. more detail. We've got to go around the belt because you've okay. got... Now, I know this is just second nature yeah. for you, but it has changed. So, it yes, has. you... Uh, We've invented plastic. As you go around the belt, exactly. So now everything's on the belt and it's uh it's got these meat hooks on the back yep. so it's uh and most of this stuff is dated anywhere from 68 to 80s and uh, so you've got a compass pouch generally the compass pouch first on aid your left. pouch but it yep, came a, with a uh, exactly it came uh, with a compass also first aid yeah. pouch uh, you put a compass in it and then a lot of times you would take this compass out and you would uh open it up and clip it right and on the front clip of your it shirt. right in front of your shirt that way that you that way you always had it now, generally, this was always on the left-hand side so that you could work it with your left hand because you're, if you're right-handed, yep. then you're, you're, got your, the, your weapon's always If you're sitting right. it on your gun, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all the metal in your rifle, we'll cause uh, this to go you see your compass you... like this, and all of a sudden you're drifting, always like, wow, what? Yeah, ask me how I know that. <laughs> well, uh, you saw the lieutenant do it once. No, yeah. no. It, and uh, then wow. you got magazine pouches. Now, if you notice, this this belt here is running three, because uh, over here I've got the trusty squad bipod. automatic so I, weapon. This, this bipod. belt would be the squad automatic weapon guy. Yeah. He gets uh, the standard. He gets seven three extra mags. Yeah. Seven magazines plus he gets an additional three. The extra so, uh, three. So he's uh, he's doing short three to five round bursts on full automatic. You got the standard butt pack. Your. Uh, your strobe light, and again, it's off your, it's yep, on your non-firing non shoulder. Non-firing shoulder. And uh, if you look at this, 
That's, that's a communications device. Team leaders because or squad leaders not, had to have a whistle. Yeah, you did not to. have squad radios back or individual yeah, radios. Individual radios. You, you might get a squad radio, but as you're doing your individual movement techniques and you're out there, you know, fire team leader followed me, do as I do. The, uh, the whistle was an audible yep. uh, along with voice calls to, uh, to control fire and maneuver. And, uh, Every grenade pouch had, uh, we, they actually modified the pockets in order to add frag grenades instead of you having loose grenades with just a strap around it. But again, always remember to run the strap through your pin. All right. yes. um, the invention of plastic on our clips True. wasn't invented, but it was a good innovation for me. A lot of people hated it. I would mm -hmm. cut the hooks off and replace it with uh, just loops of 550, yeah, 550 cords so yeah. it didn't tear up yeah. my back. You've even got the tape over your snaps to keep it from reflecting. Correct. This is authentic. Yep. This, this is, is awesome. authentic. Dude, this, this is, is... Uh, well, because uh, you know, I was on the Iranian hostage rescue mission. So we were supposed to do our 40 year reunion this year. So I set all this kid up to go to the 40 year reunion oh. and lay it out. But of course it got canceled because of COVID. So uh, I knew that every squad leader that had ever chewed my ass would be at that reunion. And he would be, <laughs> be gunning for you. Through this. And uh, yeah, oh, you didn't tape your stuff. You didn't. Tie down your canteen. Yeah. You didn't. Uh, you didn't want. You know. So I wanted it to be as authentic as I could possibly be. One canteen cup. I knew it was there yeah. because it wasn't in this one. You had exactly. to have one have canteen, one canteen cup, cup, to, cup to boil your water. The the butt pack. We call it a butt ruck because basically we would pack. You had to have a poncho. You had to have so many feet of 550 cord. You had to have your Sierra saw. You had you had stuff for starting fires. I literally, I had to live out of that thing. True. I, I had my sniper hide sight rolled up, and we literally, I lived out of that thing for 18 days. With yeah, if you're on rain, patrol, miserable, patrol, but that was it was perfect. doable. It was because, just like in World War II, when I when they when they parachuted in, we had to have everything on our body. So if you didn't have the ruck, but I, yeah. you guys have rucks. This ruck has so, grown, hasn't it? it oh, oh, it has. And so again, with the M67 fragmentation grenade, round like a baseball. Round. Uh, M17 protective mask. Uh, we rarely used them, but we always had to have them. Always, on always had left, to have them. Always on your left hip. Just in case, if, if you remember the 80s, we were probably the best in the world at doing NBC. And, and we were uh, because height of the Cold War, um, right? Uh, the biggest threat, nuclear, biological, and chemical. Biological is hard to do in combat, but uh, obviously uh, both sides had enough nukes to ensure mutual destruction. So that kind of took that off the table, and but that left chemical weapons. It was always a threat to use by proxy nations and everything. So we did. We did a lot of a yeah. lot of training. And it, it, I'm uh, glad we never it, had to use it. The Rangers probably less so, but uh, in the regular army, big I mean, army, every, every big attack out. was in mop two. You mop three when you hit uh, yeah. hit the LD. And we lost all of that within ten years. We did. Once the uh, once the wall came down, we uh, we we chucked it over, and now we're trying to reinvent it again mm -hmm. with great power competition. 1951 patrol cap, the uh, still my favorite piece of headgear, and uh, so that's uh, that's what we wore. We wore a black beret at that time, so it was similar to what the army's ru uh, running now. I'm but, sorry uh, a regular army officer took the black beret away from the Rangers. I, I'll apologize to you because he <laughs> won't have the balls to do it. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a sad day, but I, I, gotta, I, I must admit it that was the, a sad day. The, the Rangers got a pretty good deal now because I'm, I'm thinking they're pretty sexy. And they like their tan tan, oh yeah. The tan yeah. looks good. It looks tan good. It looks good. All right, so the Alice Pack. This is the uh, Alice Pack medium. And uh, similar to the one that we saw before from Vietnam, but it's, it's just it's got better straps, more pads. Uh, it's got a better uh, back pad, kidney pad here. And uh, so the Alice frame, still a, a pretty good standard if yeah. you're out there doing, doing some rock. I, 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 I like that. I don't know if it's just because I'm old, but I like it better than some of the internal frames because it gets it off your back. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, we always had a two-quart canteen on one side. We had an entrenching tool, which is the fold-up. The fold and, so, uh, so that was a big standard innovation. Standard infantry needs that mm -hmm. shovel, the dig positions, do everything. And this one again, tied down. Tied down. Because uh, you don't want this coming, coming out uh, of your rucksack, and then uh, beating your ranger buddy in the head. And uh, but this was an innovation uh, back in so the you day. Could, you so you could lock you could it like the, that, uh, angled for pickaxing, picking. Uh, or you could lock it straight out for shoveling. And, you and we shovel we had fold like the, handle. the craziest first sergeant in, in the entire regiment, and he would have us out uh, at least once or twice every month doing 
drills with Nut the bags. Uh, exactly. Yeah. First song, he became Perry. Sergeant Major yeah. too, didn't he? Oh yeah. He became Sergeant Major. <laughs> you know he did. You know he did. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'd hear stories about you, Rangers. Some of the stuff you guys would do. Just, it was. It, you know, it was uh, a great place to be a young man. Private Lamb's name tag right there. You got the name tag, yep. you got the uh, the cat eyes. Cat Again, eyes. these were Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, and uh, they were the upside down. Alpha Company had uh, the triangles right side up. Bravo Company had uh, two squares. Yep. And uh, so you could tell by the cat eyes what unit the guys were in. And a uh, place for everything, everything in its place. Everything on this thing had an SOP from, yep. your, from your bedroll to your poncho to your, uh, to your cleaning kit to your gloves and your uh, sling rope and your slap, snap link. Very disciplined organization. One of the most disciplined organizations I've ever been in. And uh, it was just an honor to serve those guys. Without a doubt. The, uh, and, and I'll go one, one last thing. If you look on the back here, you know, they had their, uh, the name tape and then the cat eyes obviously on the, uh, the patrol yep. cap as well. But you'll see a little flechette in there. And that you was, mind if I pull it out no, and show them? Flechette, guys, if you don't know what that is, that is a little nail, but the back flat part of the nail has actually been pinched in the fins and the recoilless rifle gunner. Correct. And they, they, uh, rifle. they had basically a beehive round and it would have thousands of these little nails and uh, very casually producing weapon. They would find um, enemy soldiers literally standing up with their eyes still wide open, completely nailed to a tree because that's how the weapon went off at the time. And uh, why would you have that in your headband? It's a status symbol. So if you, uh, if you had fired the 90, uh, I was not a 90 gunner, but I used to hang out with him. So every now and again, you could you uh, shoot a live round. You could they let you shoot. They throw you a bone and let you shoot a live round. So that was the the live round that I fired with the. Nice. With so you've been over, you've been carrying system. that for years, literally. Oh hell yeah. Moved from hat yeah, to yeah. hat. No, like I said, no. It's little <laughs> things like that that is the magic of uh, military history that so many people don't get. But the people that have served actually get those fine little details. That's awesome. I appreciate you doing that. So Easy amazing. Day. All right, we've got... Um, I, think, uh, I think we're going to move to a ghillie suit. All uh, right, uh, let's do that. All right, so we're, but before we do that, we're going to break one more time for another commercial break because you know YouTube. All right, guys, this week on Tactical Rifleman, I'm here with Command Sergeant Major, retired Rick Lamb, uh, literally a Special Forces uh, treasure national treasure. I, I consider him a personal friend, but I also consider him one of my few heroes that I have in the military. And uh, literally, thanks for coming out. So I'm actually, I can't thanks say, can't say yeah, it enough. It's been way too uh, long. We served, our paths crossed uh, the global war on terror. And uh, yeah, we, uh, he was my command sergeant major in uh, Horn of Africa. Yeah. And also and, in Iraq. In Iraq. During the, during the uh, yeah. 03 invasion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a good time. It, it was, was a, a great good time. time. Yeah, yeah. Um, what Winning we're going to go over is uh, that was not his last gunfight. That was not his first gunfight. But uh, the worst gunfight. The worst <laughs> gunfight was 1993. Yep, 1993. Uh, Task Force Ranger in Mogadishu. Task Force Ranger Mogadishu. You guys have all seen the movie Black Hawk Down. You guys have seen the movie. You know the movie. And he was there. This I was, was there. it. Yeah. You, you've got all of your equipment right here. This is this is what you ran. Exactly. Um, yeah. this, is, uh, this is the uniform. It's just that hodgepodge uh, kind of in between uh, conflicts. I want you to take us all through this, and then I want you to tell me about that sexy ass scar you got <laughs> on your forehead. It's gonna be awesome. Take yeah. us through it, Sergeant Major. And I had uh, you know, grew up in First Ranger Battalion. Went to Seventh Special Forces Group. So after I left 7th Special Forces Group, I got reassigned back to the Rangers in 3rd Ranger Battalion. So the, it's, it's 1992, I signed into 3rd Ranger Battalion, uh, initially as a platoon sergeant, but I get, I get sucked up to battalion ops because I'm a Special Forces guy, Owen and I trained, and mm -hmm. they just fired their battalion ops. So I was his replacement unit for a year, and then I got to go back to a platoon. Uh, the, ge the gear hadn't changed all that much. Um, it's, it's still the... Uh, the standard LCE yeah. that uh, that we were wearing that we uh, that we went through previously. So you got your canteens, got your ammo pouches. Uh, some guys were running four mag pouches now, so that uh, so you can have additional, additional ammunition. Ammo. And uh, the one big change that we had was the RBA. 
the Ranger body armor. Ranger body armor. So this big behemoth uh, you know, went over your uniform, yeah. and then your LCE went over that. At now, the time, the Army was running the flak jackets that would not stop anything but shrapnel. They would correct. not. They literally would not stop a bullet. But the Rangers, you guys, always the tip of the yeah, spear. They, took the next generation. This was probably the uh, the first generation of, uh, I know some of the special mission units were wearing that big black horse collar, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. this was the first one that uh, that the Army, it, you know, decent, decent pit of ki piece of kit for the time. Uh, one of the things that we, we found out is that uh, you got to put a uh, strap here, so you got to uh, yeah. be able to drag. Drag a, and, uh, drag a casualty. Correct. And then of course, you know, you get with the riggers and you start sewing pouches on it for camelbacks and those kinds of things. So. Yeah, this one's got a camel back sewn on the back. It's got a uh, got a, a little radio pouch, and uh, it had a uh, uh, Velcro piece there, so I could put a um, put a weapon back there, a uh, a sidearm. Retention of, the, of your rifle. Okay. Correct. So then we've got uh, so that, so we were wearing that. Now with the uh, the fatigues at the time, the uniform were uh, the chocolate chips. So we uh, we were issued the the chocolate chip pattern. Basically, it's uh, the same thing, but it's got the little black dots on it. That's why they call it the, the chocolate yeah, chip. Chocolate and this chip. was uh, this was the uh, the initial desert uniform. They just started uh, issuing these tricolors, and uh, so we the DCUs. went the DCUs. Yeah, so we went over there, kind of uh, uh, mix match, mix Hard bag. Box. Yep, exactly. I think I had uh, one or two of these DCUs, and I had about four sets of uh, of chocolate chips, and uh, never never did get the uh, the DCU. Boonie cat. Never did. So, no, never did. <laughs> now, now one, one of the things still, about it. still head, uh, still name tape, still cat eyes to match your unit SOP. Correct. So everybody yep. knew who was who. Yeah, you know, and this this big old piece of glint tape that uh, we found out much later would would flat you know blind the guys up in the, uh, yeah, the, the airframe. The AC-130 Spectre gunship. <laughs> Remember right, right after this, we went to the uh, the darker yep. the darker darker IR uh, glint tape, but this one still got the, uh, the the piece that I had back in the day. Uh, I got I got this jacket from one of my buddies, and because uh, at the Rangers we weren't allowed to do that yet, but uh, he uh, one of my buddies in the special mission unit was able to. You know, they, because cut they had the actually cut the pockets, off, yeah. had sewn them on the sleeves, and uh, so I kept this one right through to, to Djibouti. I think this is the, the one, one you're wearing. Uh, yeah, one to wear on that. Exactly. Yeah. That's so, awesome. uh, and of course, the t shirts from back in that day, we went from green to, you know, if you're in these, uh, that, uh, the, the brown light, and then different yeah, shades of tan. Yeah. Brown and tan, exactly. And uh, so we were, we were kind of a hodgepodge because we didn't have. Uh, didn't have the desert tan for this yet, so you're wearing ODs, ODs, uh, knee pads. So yep. uh, we're out. The, this is the first uh, time that you saw the Ranger Regiment in uh, in knee pads, and uh, they were just the standard standard issue with the little hook on the side. I and, still have uh, them in the attic. They're spray painted brown, but they're the exact same. <laughs> yes. Literally the exact same one, black with 12 coats of brown spray paint on. Now the boots, uh, the standard issue uh, desert boot. These uh, these were a pretty good boot, but you'd uh, remember you'd, you'd just shred the bottom. They wear out, yeah. And they wore out fast. This isn't the the pair that I had. The actual pair that I had, I gave to SOCOM because when I got wounded, you know, I bled a lot, and so I, I gave the the one to SOCOM that had the the blood and the freaking brain uh, matter on the uh, cerebral fluid. That's what I'm trying to get at. The cerebral fluid on it, and it's on a it's on a little stand soldiers cross in you socom can now say it's at the socom museum <laughs> exactly <laughs> so he has a um i've got dna at the socom museum he was shot in the face <laughs> i want that to sink in all right literally just where's the scar yeah right right here right uh you can i still got a little dent a little divot if you were a divot yeah a little divot and you're still yeah. here. They just can't keep you down. Gave me a personality, exactly. And we were wearing the uh, the standard K-pot, and uh, I actually That's a have standard K-pot. The uh, how did you get shot in the melon wearing, wearing a standard K-pot? All right, so no shit there I was, because that's what every war story starts with, right? Yeah. So we're driving down the road, my driver gets hit, and uh, so Ranger. You guys you are seeing this in the movie, all right? He's literally seeing it from inside the vehicle right now. So Ranger Easterbrook's uh, shot in the hand, so he can't drive. So we grab him, throw him up on the, uh, you know, across the, across the transmission hump. We do the dead driver drill. I, I get over, and now I'm driving, working the throttle. And I had my helmet on, and uh, so 
So I just I just went, God damn, pulled it back like that because you remember the headache she used yeah, to do. Oh, yeah. that, 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 Wipe like my brow that. and then pap, 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 ding. And uh, so I so I got nailed. But it was Did it you was drive just, all the way back to base like that? No, actually, you know, it was weird. I uh, initially when I saw the blood come out, you know, it was uh, we're running, you know, blackout drive. So yeah. it's the, the and then I just see the shadow of the blood go and it hits the uh, the speedometer. And I go, God damn it, I just got killed. And, uh, and I fucking slump forward and everything goes to this pristine dot, right? Like an old tube TV. Yeah, that somebody just and, and I'm, the plug. That's right. I'm, I'm heading to Fiddler's Green, right? So uh, <laughs> then I, since I'm driving, I hear the kids. The next thing I hear is the kids in the back and they're smacking me in the back of the K-pot going, don't stop here. Do not stop here. And uh, so I push the helmet back down to stop the bleeding. Mash the uh, the freaking gas, uh, pedal. gas pedal, grabbed the handset, and called in the two wounded that we had in the uh, in the vehicle. And we stayed like that until we lost the vehicle later. It had been so shot up, the tires were flat. Um, our oil, we had no more oil because the oil pan had yeah. been. Uh, it, it was actually an RPG that went across the hood and uh, and then you know hit a wall, and I got some of the shrapnel off of that. So, but at the time, I thought it was uh, pieces of the wall. Because obviously I was still alive, so yeah. I, didn't, you know, I didn't think it was a piece of shrapnel. So when I got medevaced, um, I got to the mash, and it was uh, it was a long because we had 75 kids wounded, so and some of them you know very badly. So uh, and I was ambulatory, I was walking, you know, I had all my faculties, and uh, so I just I left because all those you know they they were they were trying to get to me. They were very apologetic, and uh, so I went and got my kit, went back because I had a zero two guard shift in the morning, right? So I had from <laughs> two to ten. And uh, so I went back, went to sleep, got up, did my guard duty. And uh, about two days later, Doc Marsh, you know, our battalion surgeon, he comes by and he goes, uh, follow my finger. And so I'm following his finger and he goes, you're lamb, right? I said, yes, sir. He says, you walked out of the hospital. He said, we've been looking for you for two days. He said, don't ever do that again or we'll <laughs> fucking court martial you. So they send me back to the hospital and then I get the CAT scan and uh, they find out that there's a, a little, little, nugget in there it had clipped the uh, left front lobe and then it stopped between the left and right front lobes and uh, so when i got medevaced they did the surgery they uh they cut me from here up peeled the face down cut about a battalion sized coin out of the melon nice. and then he went so in you and always he, have your coin yeah. with you now always. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know when the doctor's telling me all this he said I, I i kept the scar and you'll never see it and i said Doc, I'm a ranger. I'm an infantryman. Yeah. I said, you should have gave me a, a barn <laughs> scar. You should have like, opened it up yeah, from here. That way I look cool. And, uh, yeah. I, mean, I, just, I lost all bragging rights. He ripped you off and, so uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But he, as, as it turned out, he, he wasn't able to get the shrapnel out because it was, it was too deep. So he just cleaned it up, sewed it back up. I think I spent about three months in the hospital because it, it was infected. And uh, so they were just nuking me with all this meds. My, my skin cleared up. I mean, I was, my, my pee was lime green, you know, my poop was lime green. It was freaking awesome. But that was it. And so that helmet I've got hanging on the wall. This is, uh, this is you know, a helmet from another display, but it's actually got the, the, um, the cover still on with it. With all the biohazard. And, uh, because it just, uh, it just clipped, the, that's what slowed it down. It the just edge of clipped it. the edge of it. So it's still got a small hole here and then a bunch of blood stain there, but I, I don't travel with that. So, but we were wearing this, this helmet uh, again, but it had a desert cover on it. But that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Rick really is a national treasure. And uh, I'm sincere when I say that. So you're going to see more of uh, Command Sergeant Major Rick Lamb yes. retired. Uh, in the future, we're going to do more tactical rifleman videos with this fine gentleman right here. I'm, I'm saying we and kid up and we, and we go old school. We run into Thompson. Like, like, you you were fond do of that big ass rifle, the yeah. M1. Oh yeah. So maybe me on the Thompson, you on the M1, and we'll just and get we'll after. Go some, uh, and we're drills. jumping Normandy. Let's jump into Normandy. All right, let's do it. All right. Uh, Y'all, uh, it's been a pleasure. I can't say enough, so I'm no. ready. It has and been again, a pleasure, guys. I'm, I'm, I am happy that our paths have crossed again. Without a doubt. You're, we you're served one of the best together damn soldiers in, that I ever had. Yeah, guys like you made me, uh, got me promoted. <laughs> I got promoted on the backs of guys like you. <laughs> yeah. We served, our, our paths did cross uh, during the global war on terror, and uh, is one of the greatest SAR majors I ever had the pleasure of serving underneath. And uh, yeah. Uh, that's all we've got. We will see you next time. Y'all take care and shoot straight.
If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss out on anything.